Welcome to the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, host for this episode and member of the Black Doctoral Network. Today, I am joined by Dr. Nicole Davis, a United States Navy veteran, a Christian life coach, social science researcher, and a conflict resolution practitioner. First, I would like to say thank you for your service, Dr. Davis. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. (laughs) If you will, please start out telling our viewers and our listeners a little about your background. Where did it all start for you? Yes, absolutely. Well, I have my humble beginnings in Akron, Ohio. That's where my family is. I was raised in a single family household. Uh, My dad was in and out of our lives. Uh, He and my mom were together for decades, yet they never married, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, I'm the oldest of three girls. I actually went to the military straight out of high school. I saw it as my way to be able to travel and to go to college because college just wasn't an option straight out of high school. There were no funds for anything like that. So thank God for the military, which has made the difference in so many people's lives, but that's actually another conversation. So I went to the military and uh, I was able to travel like I wanted to. And uh, during those travels, when I found myself in Iceland, Keflavik, Iceland, I was able to start schooling. Um, The University of Maryland had a European division there. And my husband, not at the time, but we worked together. We were co-workers. He helped me get started with college courses. So we eventually got married and we started our family in Spain. That was our next duty duty station. We went to Spain. And once he was done with his tour, we moved to Maryland, which is his hometown. Uh, and we've been here ever since. So that was 1994. And we've uh, since had another son. We have two adult sons. Uh, one is in Pittsburgh. He works for the Department of Justice. And then our younger son, he is currently in law school studying entertainment law. Wow, such a rich background. I love it. <laughs> Thank you mm-hmm. for sharing yes. that. So you have had 20 years of experience in the field of alternative dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. One of the common forms of ADR is mediation. How effective is mediation in resolving conflicts and reaching an agreement with various parties? Okay, so that's really a two-part answer. First of all, mediation in and of itself is absolutely amazing. It's the mediators who give the participants either a wonderful experience or a not so wonderful experience. Reaching an agreement, if that's the ultimate goal of the mediator, then you can actually hurt the parties. Because when you're agreement focused, you're more transactional in your approach. Now, depending on the kind of mediation it it is, uh, sometimes transactional is what's most important because maybe the parties don't know each other. But the premise, even for that, it needs to be that you're helping them deal with the conflict, which is really where the fracture is. So if you're helping people deal with their crisis, you're really trying to restore a meaningful uh, interaction between the two. And most of our mediations are, you know, workplace, family, community type mediations where you need what we call a relational approach because you want them to be able to resume um, a relationship with one another once they are participating in mediation. That may or may not lead to an agreement, but if you can restore the relationship, then that's a win in and of itself. I love that because as a K-12 um, educator, elementary principal, we use that same premise with our mm. elementary students with peer mediation mm-hmm. that we want to help mediate the issue. So I, I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and it's a, a good marker <laughs> that we're in the right direction. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love that. And I've done a, quite a bit of um, work with schools and peer mediation programs. And of course you are teaching them to be civil and more courteous and respectful of one another. And how do you deal with conflict? We wanna deal with conflict in the same way to maintain those relationships and friendships. So it makes it worth, it's, it's more enjoyable and rewarding when the relationship is the outcome as opposed to an agreement per se. Yeah. Thank you for that. So who has had a tremendous impact on you as a Christian life coach? 
I would say Dr. Lilo Bush. She's actually the founder of the Professional Christian Coaching and Counseling Academy. And what I love about her approach is she's a Bible purist. All of her trainings and her workshops are strictly Bible-based, and that's what appeals to me. Thank you. What's the best advice you've ever received and the best advice you've given? Okay, so just a little backstory so that it all comes together. Uh, our children's godparents, the godmother in particular, uh, this was when our sons were in elementary school. And one of the things that was really important to me was to be a stay-at-home mom. Once I was in the military and we started our family, that was one of the reasons we got out because I didn't want to travel all over with them. I wanted them to have a stable home. They could develop relationships with friends. And so making that choice to be a stay-at-home mom was financially very difficult for us as a family because I was, you know, I had my bachelor's degree by then. Um, we were living in our own home, but it was hard to, to meet all of our bills. And I remember one day I was talking to her about the contemplation of going back to work. And she said to me, she said, Nicole, she said, parenting done right is hard work and you get one chance to parent your children. You will get multiple chances to make money. So focus on what's most important to you right now. And I never forgot that. In fact, I do give that as advice. But the other thing that I also say to people is two things, have a standard. And then when you're making decisions, no matter what it's about, always consider at what cost are you going to do whatever it is that you're contemplating. So that's what I would say for um, some fantastic advice given and received. I love that. Yes, <laughs> it really aligns because I always say for every yes, there's a no. Yes. <laughs> and that's exactly what you're saying. There is a cause for your yes. Yes, so and I, I remember um, because for us, and we'll talk about it more as we go along, family is everything. And I've watched and experienced being on the back end of a bad decision by a parent that ultimately impacts a child in a way that the parent can never fully understand the ramifications of. And as a result of that, I have always been very mindful and self-aware. If we do this, what's going to happen or how is this going to set us back or what's going to be the impact while it may feel good and look right to us at what cost? Because the children may not see all these material things that's so wonderful if it means we're always stressed or frustrated, we're always fighting, we're never home. And so looking at it from that perspective, through that lens, it helped us to stay very grounded in what we were pursuing as what was important to us. I love that, thank you. Now your dissertation topic was women in ministry, how conflicts between God's purpose and church doctrine impact the efficacy of female church leaders. Very mm -hmm. powerful, by the way. Thank you. Please share your findings on this research. Okay, so the data analysis confirmed everything that we already know. The existence and ongoing challenges that women face in the churches and through church organizations, it still exists. Um, whether it's gender bias, discrimination, the male domination symbolism, which is really strong and influential still. Uh, women are, are looking for ways to challenge this, this, this patriarchal culture uh, and the symbolism in the church. And uh, it's still believed that women are inadequate to lead in church, even if they're leading well in the marketplace, it's as if those skills don't transfer to the church. And it doesn't matter whether the woman believes she's called, it's not important. Um, church tradition still supersedes the abilities of the leaders. You know, it doesn't matter if the woman is competent, if the man is not competent, because he is a man, he's going to get that position over the woman. The needs of the congregation don't matter. Um, cultural relevance isn't important. Um, there's no support still of the, or encouragement of women leaders being elevated, recognized, supported in the church. Wow. 
amazing. Mm -hmm. And and you've spoken about how important family is and, and your why is clear. It's your family. Yes. How important is it as a relationship coach for you to demonstrate that healthy family dynamic? Well, it's, it's extremely important. Um, and why it's so important is because we need to see it model. You know, information is prevalent. You can get a ton of information, but how to apply that information is difficult for us. Well, that's what we took our time doing, becoming what we were saying, not just um, practicing what we preach, but preach what we practice. And then that way, what we say, you know, we can show the receipts for who we are and what we've done. As a matter of fact, we didn't write our first book, Parenting Done Right is Hard Work, but it's worth it until our boys were both gone off to college. We needed to see if everything we had taught, if they could stand independent of us, without us around, making right choices, doing the right things, uh, when there was no one to answer to but the Lord himself. And so because they were able to do that, not without hiccups and bumps, um, but their, their, their foundation was strong. And so that once we saw, okay, we're not going to look like hypocrites. Um, we're not going to be um, um, only speaking what we theoretically know we can go ahead and do this. We can write the books and start the organization. So it's extremely important. I love that. And you actually made a valid point about the bumps and the hiccups. A lot of people think if there are problems that they're not good parents. And that's not what you're saying at all. No. And I love that. And I think people need to hear that because there will be bumps and hiccups <laughs> while you're parenting. That's a part of the parenting process. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Well, it goes, it's twofold. One, it doesn't mean that we're bad parents um, because one of the things that the Lord showed me uh, when they were very young, because we do, we want everything to appear right and that we're doing everything right. But he told me that their success nor their failure was mine to claim. That all I could do was give them the tools expose them to various opportunities and to live as an example before them. And then it is up to them to do and to make those same choices for themselves. And as a matter of fact, I mean, even while they were in college, we were teaching them, we didn't want them to be straight A students. That wasn't what the goal was. It was, are you well-rounded? Are you considerate? Are you integral? Do you know how to form relationships with people? Are you a leader or a follower? Do you tell the truth? You know, just character type things. Though That's what we were focusing on. And if you don't know how to rebound from a failure, then we're setting you up for failure when you get out in the real world, because the world is a cruel place. And how we are able to weave and bob we even Bob, that's where you see your strength and your ability to do that. So no, we were never trying to have perfect children. We always wanted to have children who were responsive, who are productive, who are caring, uh, and who want to live their best life doing the best that they can. And that's all we could ever ask of them. Thank you for that. <laughs> so how do you stay abreast of all of the current trends in your field? Well, everything mainstream. I, I look at everything, you know, that other people look at, Christian and secular articles alike. Um, I'm on YouTube watching videos. I'm listening to TED Talks, podcasts, other organizations that are doing the same work that we're doing or being involved with other organizations, hearing what their needs are. So anytime... Tony and I are doing work together because we do this work together. And that's the other thing. Um, when you see us, when we're teaching a parenting course or we are um, presenting somewhere, he and I are presenting together. When we do coaching, we coach together because that's just not modeled. We don't see what that looks like for two people who have very different ideas and opinions at times. Um, but our foundation is the same. Our ultimate goals and desires are the same. And so how we get there is where the real work takes place. And so we're able to give that from the male and female perspective, especially if we're working with a couple. They need to hear it from both perspectives because we don't always think 
the thing they need to do is the same as the other person. And we can all talk that through together. So all of those things, my actual job, I still work for the federal government. So I'm always around conflict and harassment data uh, and working around it every day. Thank you. And you mentioned Tony, who is your husband. Yes. Um, and you both co-founded Empower to Engage. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your work with Empower to Engage? Yes. So we are the co-founders and we are co-authors of a number of books. So I mentioned that we did um, Parenting Done Right is Hard Work. And all of our books are devotionals. So the parenting one, it's a daily devotional. And it also gives you um, prayers at the end. So it teaches parents how to pray about these various topics, but it's the um, Parenting Done Right is Hard Work and it's how to win the battle for your children. This is the book. And then we have Marriage Done Right is Hard Work, but it's worth it, which is also a 31 day guide, but it's how to put the fun, fire and focus back into your marriage. That's this book. And then we also have Leadership Done Right is Hard Work, but it's worth it. So we call this the Done Right series. It's three of three books. And this devotional um, are essential disciplines to becoming a leader of impact from the inside out. Because when we talk about leadership, or most, time we, most times we hear about leadership, it's more from an external approach. But we believe the best leaders are those who first know how to lead themselves. So these devotionals are excellent. We've gotten great responses from those who have worked on them Couples normally both get their own copy so that they can work on them and write in them um, as they are doing it together or Bible study groups. So that's what we, we've created as co-founders, or co-authors. As co-founders, we um, hold workshops, we do trainings, we speak, um, and we're providing strategies and resources also with coaching, as I mentioned earlier, to help couples build stronger families, marriages, or individuals if they need personal development. And as we talked about earlier, it's all from a Christian perspective. Awesome work. Thank you for that. So your newly released book, Eve, Where Are You? is yes. a spinoff actually from your dissertation. Mm -hmm. Now in this book, you evaluate bias practices in the Christian church, which we've already addressed um, about your findings from your dissertation. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on certain church organizations that still prohibit women from ministering through the word of God? Yeah. Um, Gender bias and discrimination, to me, these are cultural and religious roadblocks. They really hinder the church from um, being relevant today. You know, a lot of women are despondent because they can't find themselves in the church. We talk about the word of God and we talk about the power in the word of God and that you need faith. But if my faith doesn't allow me to exercise the call on my life, in this environment or within this institution, then why am I here? And so that's what a lot of women are struggling with, trying to, to see how, how this the church is relevant for them. I also say that it's, it's handicapping the very people who they're there to help if they're not able to, to help build this church, except for you know whatever jobs we say they can have as pastors and leadership, if they're not allowed to help build and work in the very areas that they feel called to, um, then the level of commitment from the, the um, church attend attendees is going to dwindle. And, and that's what we're seeing is happening. I also think it's a very narrow focus uh, and quite limiting when we're all made in the image and likeness of God, why are we not all treated the same way? And so when you think about those things and the fact that, you know, there's power in these women who are skilled and are called, but it's untapped. How can you say you are trying to advance the kingdom when who he has made are not allowed to participate in what he de desires for his church? Wow. That's actually powerful because, you know, it, it is still, it's still out there, as you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is. It is. And the younger women, which is quite alarming to me, younger women are saying it. So, you know, it's still being taught. 
And if it's being taught, in, and it's not just being taught in the churches, it's at home. They're seeing it at home. And we're treating one of the things that, that we found, and um, I actually have a podcast, Eve, Where Are You podcast. My husband and I are on there together, and we're talking through all the scriptures that have been used um, to defend why women are not allowed to, to have active roles in leadership in the church. But um, that's one of the things that I think is really important to note is that we've, we've, it's up to us. We've got to decide that we're no longer going to put up with it or we're willing to do whatever is necessary to make the changes so that everybody can play a part. Wow, thank you. You mentioned Eve, Where Are You podcast. And so I had the opportunity to listen and in episode 21, you discuss women on the front line, a coronavirus discussion. You referenced the Bloomberg article that was entitled, uh, Women Are Bearing the Brunt of Coronavirus Disruption. Um, it was published March 11, 2020. And that was right, at least in this area, um, in the DMV, that was right at the height of uh, the pandemic, basically. Everything began to shut down mid-March. So in your opinion, does the main idea of this article still ring true today? And we are almost at March again, 2021. Yes, yes unfortunately it does. Uh, and it's interesting because I was looking at an article from the National Geographic and they actually call women shock absorbers. How about that? Because our role has never changed. And no matter what you put before us, we rise. And it's the same with COVID. It, but the impact on us and on our children, because you know we're talking to a lot of school teachers, um, people are at their wit's end because they have expended, they are beyond their limits and capacity. And, and you're not getting the support that you maybe normally get from the village because everybody is trying to um, protect themselves. So it's increasingly harder for women and yet they are still doing what's necessary at home, still needing to work because there's still, you know, a lot of single parent households where she is still required to be every woman. And that doesn't change because there's a pandemic. So yes, it's still going on. Women are still on the front lines. They're holding it down. They're making it happen. Um, and it's, it's costing them, you know, again, at what cost it's costing them. And, and I just, my prayer and the words of encouragement that I offer is that you must take time for yourself. You've got to replenish. It's very hard to keep giving what you don't have. And so while it must be done, it, we must have wisdom in the doing or we won't be able to do for long. So that's what I offer. Wow. Thank you. Now, on your web show, Family Futures Today, you challenge couples to dig deep. You want them to <laughs> identify what's necessary to create a fulfilling relationship. What would you say is the number one challenge couples face when they come to you? I think the number one, the number one issue would be, or challenge would be unity. Couples don't have a vision for the relationship. And if they're married, they don't have a vision for the family. And of course, if you don't have a vision, that means you don't know how to communicate. You know, you don't know how to support each other. And because we are very independent, just as a, a society, our Western culture and our Western society, we, we are more independent in nature as opposed to a collective um, the minute I feel like you're getting in the way of what I'm trying to do, I'm no longer thinking about us as a unit. I'm thinking about self-preservation. So if couples beyond ooh, you cute or ooh, you have money would sit down and talk about where do you see us? Where do you see you? How can I support that? And they both need to say it. Um, I remember just with my husband and I, we... We took turns going to college. Like I finished my bachelor's, then he got his bachelor's, then I got my master's, then he got his 
master's, his MBA in JD, and then I got my PhD. And all the time, that whole time, we are supporting each other. Like, you got, if I need you to go pick up the kids, you got to deal with the homework. Okay, I got you. The same, vice versa, because we knew what we were trying to accomplish as a family, not just me independent of him, but us together for the example we wanted to give to our sons. I'm going to tell you, I absolutely love that. I've been married 18 years and I never <laughs> thought of a plan for yes. us that you yes. think strategic plan for your, for your business. Come or on. Oh my, it's just like a light bulb. Just kidding. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that because I don't think just like me sitting here, yeah. I don't think people think of that. What, well, what do we want for us in five years? What I love that Dr. Davis. Yes. No, we don't. We don't think like that. And it's the same with parenting. Like we don't know how to parent. Yes. Just because we have a child doesn't mean that we're ready or equipped knowledgeable to do what's necessary to give this child the best possible uh, opportunity to grow and to thrive. You have to pursue that like you pursue anything else. You got to read the books. You got to go to the seminars. You got to talk to people. You got to share your challenges and your struggles. You don't just do what mama and them did because that didn't work. <laughs> so you have to be intentional about your family, your parenting, your marriage, your goals, your vision, and how do we play in that together? That's why, you know, when it comes to the church and the fact that you will turn your, your back to someone who is equipped to make the difference in what we're trying to accomplish beyond what you think they can do, it just is such a paralyzing, it's paralyzing. And it's so unfortunate because there's so much more that could be done when we do it together. And it's the same for couples. How many marriages can be saved if they just knew how to have these conversations and to know, you know, we're really on the same side wanting to deal with these issues together. We're not against one another. We're in partnership. And it's the same with our kids. Tony and I have always shown, we've shown the boys a united front. Like you cannot pit one of us against the other because had it not been for us, you guys would not be here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're really clear on what these dynamics need to look like for, the, for it to work best for all of us together. I love it. I tell you. So what skills would you say have helped you become as successful as you are now? Yes, definitely discipline. I'm a very disciplined person, uh, time management. And one of the biggest things I think that's been helpful to me is being able to say no, because no one can tell me what's best for me outside of me. Like you can make suggestions, but I know what I'm dealing with at home. I know what my children need. And so for external forces that want my time or think I should be doing this, or you're so wonderful for this and this. Okay, well, no, thank you, but no. So those are the three things I would offer that that's what comes to mind immediately. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm telling you, because that no thing is real. That no thing. I, that's one of the things from this pandemic that I have discovered. I need to say no, no more often. <laughs> yes, it's powerful. It's powerful, it powerful. and exhilarating. It is a very valid point. I always say, if it doesn't make me happy, make me better, make me money, I'm probably going to say no. <laughs> yes. And you know what? And to think about it, though, I don't, it doesn't have to necessarily make me happy because, you know, we, when God is calling you to something, because mm -hmm. we don't always know what it's going to That's yield. True. It's in our obedience and in our faith that we go ahead and do that thing. That's true. But I need to know that this is what's right for me right now. Because I've done a number of things that didn't make me happy, mm -hmm. but I did them because they were necessary for whatever it was that, that was supposed to happen next in my life. Absolutely. So it's being very um, contemplative and the at what cost. That always comes back for me um, because there are a lot of things I'm not comfortable doing that I do, 
Um, and there are things that I do for longer periods of time than I would like to, but I'm very, I'm trying to be very mindful. Is this what I should be doing or is it something else? And when I know that this is not it, the answer is swift no. I love With it. a smile. <laughs> <laughs> With a smile. Yeah, a pleasant no. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what are you most proud of in your career? Ooh, of course that doctorate, because that right there, oh my Lord, for a long time, I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but that is probably my greatest accomplishment. And then I would say, um, seeing the fruit of my labor showing in the lives of others, like having these types of conversations and then seeing people go and implement that in their lives or coming back and telling us, you know, what they've done or how it's impacted their family or seeing um, a child be able to get in a college because my husband talked to them about best choices and figuring out, I did, you know, who your child is, what their strengths are, uh, whether they're natural proclivities and then helping them put a plan together. Like those are the kind of things that bring me joy beyond what I can, because then we know we're multiplying like that, you know? So. I love it. Cause I'm definitely creating that plan for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to definitely implement that. <laughs> So what steps do you take to reach your goals? So I, um, I take the approach of spirit, soul, and body. Prayer every day, Bible reading every day. I keep people around me who are positive and who are driven just like me and who are supportive. Like that's who I need as as a buffer you know to help me because I'm not always strong and so they can help me and encourage me during those times and then I would say eating right and exercise uh, I I really respect my body I don't just do whatever I want I understand that this is uh, my temple I need to respect it and if I want it to produce at the levels that I needed to produce then I need to sleep I need to rest and I need to watch, you know, what I'm putting in here and definitely a time of, you know, getting centered, being prayerful, thoughtful. So that's, that's what I do to reach my goals. I love that. Do you, do you believe in the power of manifestation, vision and writing things down to make them manifest? What's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I believe that those things can work. I have, I wouldn't say that I have not, I've used those. Like that is not my go-to. Like I write it down. I, I say positive affirmations every day. I don't do that. I, because I, the scripture that always comes to mind with things like that is many of the, are the plans in a man's heart, but it's God's purpose that prevails. And so I want my vision and the desires of my heart to line up with what God has for me. And so if I'm writing what I think, because if I did what I wanted, I wouldn't even be with my husband. I wasn't even smart enough to know he was the man for me. But through prayer and fasting, Lord, is this the man for me? Because your mate, and this is a whole nother conversation, your mate, the choice of your mate is probably one of the most important choices you will ever make in your life. So to just be fooling around with these guys that don't mean you no good, or you can see already that they're not accomplishing things, they're not focused, you know, you always got to bail them out and all of that, you already set, you're setting yourself up for failure. So honey, I can tell you. I'm so glad I asked you this question. Yeah. <laughs> so I am Trying to hear from God. I, yes, I, I love that. To do my thing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for yeah. that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, what's next for Dr. Nicole Davis? Well, um, because of this release of my book, I'm now working with my publicist on marketing and advertising. I do want to set up some curriculum, um, actually, for parenting workshops. In addition to the work that I'm doing with Eve, where are you? So, those are the two biggest things that's happening right now. Um, I, we're really getting ready to do a full blitz with this book. 
uh, cause I'm ready for the conversation. I'm ready, you know, whatever's gonna come with it because we've, we've got to get women in position um, to do what's necessary to advance us all. It's gonna make the difference in our lives and our families to see women fulfilled and to have examples Black women examples, women examples of being and living and doing what brings satisfaction and joy and fulfillment for them. We've got to do it. So that's where I, I'm focused right now. Awesome. So how has your affiliation with the Black Doctoral Network enhanced you professionally? Yes. So, you know, that saying, um, if you're the smartest person in the room or in the circle, you need a, a bigger circle. Okay, well, that's how I see BDN. BDN expands my circle. I get a chance to interact with those who, people who are amazing, who are highly intelligent, and I love that. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Davis. This has just been an absolute pleasure. I just want to thank you for joining us today. Wow. I, I just, oh, I love it. I love it. It's been a joy. Yeah, it has been an absolute delight. Can you please share with our viewers and listeners where they can go to learn more about you and all of the work that you're doing? Yes. Uh, EmpowerToEngage.com. That's one of our websites. Uh, and then EveWhereAreYou.com is the other. And that talks about the book specifically. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, email if someone wants to email me, they certainly can at info at empowertoengage.com. Awesome. And our viewers, we thank you as well. Please be sure to stay connected to the Black Doctorial Network and connect with us on all of our social media channels. Thank you for joining us today for the Black Doctors Talk podcast. I'm Dr. Sharon H. Porter. We hope you will join us again. But for now, please be sure to like share, subscribe, and tell a friend.